Okay, thanks very much to the organizers, and uh, thanks to Mark for uh, over the last couple of years both inviting us to uh, come visit his lab and see how it's done and uh, take some inspiration, and also for twisting our arm and telling us, you know, you really got to think about how you're going to mark this up and disseminate this large data set. So this is sort of where we're exiting the prototyping stage and entering the dissemination stage. So um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, learn from you guys. Um, so I'm from uh, the Reed Lab in the Department of Neurobiology at Harvard Medical School. Um, and I'll be at Genalia probably in March. Um, so very quick overview of uh, some biology and, uh, and then hopefully get to some sort of half-baked thoughts on what it's like to be on the ground dealing with these data and trying to interface with CS people and uh, infrastructure and modeling people. Um, so biology, uh, our preparation is in vivo calcium imaging of mouse visual cortex and all you really need to know um, is that we uh, shine infrared light down into um, the upper layers of cortex and we come out, we give the animal visual stimulation. So th this is the, p the point, this color code is going to be um, present in many slides for the rest of the talk, so um, it's important to try to internalize it. Um, and so what we do is we present the animal with drifting gratings uh, of differing orientations. And um, these orientations are color-coded. Uh, the green is a drifting grating, uh, a vertical grating, and red is horizontal, and blue and yellow are intermediate. And when we do this, we see that in the rodent, um, there's this salt and pepper organization of uh, preferential responses to differing orientations. So for example, that red cell right there responds preferentially to horizontal stimuli moving up and down in the animal's visual field. Um, now what we'd like to do is um, begin to understand some of the um, connection principles that might uh, underlie the, the buildup of these specific receptive field structures. So for example, do in layer 2-3 cells connect to each other preferentially if they're similarly tuned to visual stimuli? Um, and so, you know, this is just represented schematically here. Um, and might they receive input in common from drivers from lower layers? Um, uh, and, and, and is there specificity at this level? Um, no. Just to sort of make it clear, we didn't answer it in this first round, um, but this is the sort of question that motivates us. Um, and you'll see what we did answer as I, I go through the talk. Now, um, this is a, a beautiful uh, paired recording and fill from the Sackman lab. And I use it to actually to motivate the reason uh, for, for focusing on high throughput image acquisition at the EM level. And the reason is, is that, as I've just shown, there's some reason to think, well, maybe there's specificity and connectivity in, in the cells um, in, the, in the rodent visual system. And so to untangle it, we need to acquire these very large volumes. And we have uh, a layer four cell projecting up to two, three. And um, you see the... Um, axonal arbor shooting up here in blue, and then these collaterals um, uh, are the axonal arbor of the 2-3 cell, and then in black are the dendritic arbor. So um, if you want to actually understand uh, the, the connectivity at the level of individual cells and individual synapses in a many-to-many -many fashion, um, you've got to acquire large, high-resolution uh, volumes of data. And at the time we began the project, this was about, this was, you know, approximately the state of the art of commercially available TEM camera systems, uh, about a half a megapixel per second of 8-bit eight, eight pixels. Um, and if you run this uh, for six months, 24-7, you end up with a cube that's about that big. So you're not really encompassing too much of the circuit. Um, if you crank it up a little bit, you start to get that projection if you ran it for six months, 24-7, but you're still fairly impoverished. And if you go up by another order of magnitude, you get into an interesting regime uh, where you're, you're talking about having millimeter cubes of cortex. And a lot of us in this sort of emerging world of uh, like connectomics, um, if you want to call it that, um, synaptoprojectomics. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, 
whatever you want to call it, a lot of us have this millimeter cube idea uh, as a sort of um, maybe attainable yet um, still ambitious goal um, that will enable us to begin answering some fundamental questions about cortical organization. Um, so in any event, in the, in the nearer term, um, just to do um, uh, a, little, a little piece of work, um, I see I've lost a slide in my last minute organization, so I'm sorry, I'll have to back up for a second. So what we did is we targeted a band in this volume from this experiment and so from that line to that line is about a 50 micron wedge and um, we wanted to look at the connectivity of the cells characterized in that wedge and the reason we're just doing this little wedge is because we can't acquire it 100 megapixels per second yet um, we can barely acquire enough to answer um, more local questions and so to do that that 50 micron wedge, if you're going to do 40 nanometer sections, you're talking about 1,250 sections. To do something interesting, let's say going from the surface of cortex down to uh, layer 2-3, uh, th you know, containing all of layer 2-3, you need a pretty good size field of view. And um, you need a pretty high resolution. And so you're talking about 120,000 by 80,000 pixel images of each one of these sections, or, you know, 11 terabytes of data. Um, so it turns out that you know, imaging speed becomes rate limiting very quickly. Um, and, and then the approach will be, as I'll show you, is to segment or mark up those data um, very, very specifically, starting with the cells whose function we know. So just, you know, just to give you a sense, we, we took this TEM and jacked it up on stilts and extended the vacuum chamber. Um, so that the final projected image is enlarged, like a photographic enlargement. Then down there we have this camera array of commodity uh, cameras um, and this bank of readout PCs. Um, and I'll skip over these details, um, but if anybody's interested, I'm happy to talk about them. Um, the, real, the real point here is that we're parallelizing readout because uh, current CCDs, um, the, the rate limiting um, parameter in their readout speed is the linear edge length uh, of, of the array. So if we break it up into um, a, an array of camera lenses with overlapping fields of view, we can get very fast readout rel relatively cheaply. And we get away, uh, Mark has a beautiful, Mark Ellisman has a beautiful system um, with really nice lenses and it's very well optimized. We get away with this kind of crummy lossy system because um, in order to image quickly with, with, with these poor collecting optics, we just crank up the dose and that's something we can get away with in our, in our world. So we have this array of lenses with overlapping fields of view. We can do some background correction and stitch it and take the inscribed square. We end up with this uh, you know, 25 megabyte um, image and we get that about every two seconds. Um, we can move the sample around on the stage and acquire arrays of these tiles um, and we can stitch them. This is old, so we had artifacts. I'll talk about that, but basically we can stitch them and we see the kind of resolution that we get where we can resolve individual vesicles clustering at a synapse and that's the name of the game. Um, and that just shows raw pixels or um, gives a sense. Um, okay, so the system can acquire from PIA to white matter in about two hours. And if you zoom in, you get you know, what you need to do the reconstructions. Um, uh, I'll skip over this. It just describes the network architecture. Um, basically, we're benefiting from you know, Moore's Law and high-speed storage and networking. And other than that, it's classic TEM. Um, it's a pretty fair thing to say. Um, okay, so we have a bunch of overheads still. Um, I won't, I won't, I'm going to skip over this and, and try to get to the biology. Okay, so we cut this series and um, we did okay. We lost two sections during pickup, 20 during imaging. Um, we've got a 450 by 350 field of view, about 34 terabytes of raw data, and 10 terabytes of net real 8-bit voxels. Um, that, that, that comprise the actual data set. And one of the sections in the data set looks like this. Um, here's PIA. Uh, actually, I'll just, okay, so 
115,000 pixels by 80,000 pixels of actual brain, and then you know some overhead for the surrounding resin. Um, see some anatomical features: cortical surface, cell bodies, blood vessels, and you can start to make out the layers. Okay, and when we align this data set and and do a false color um, volume rendering. Um, you can start to see what we really have. And so this is EM data, actually. Um, and it's just a projection, and it's, it's false colored through the, through the aligned data set. And um, in this false coloring regime, you can see the blood vessels are pink, and you see the nuclei of all the somata, and you see these bands of apical dendrites streaming up. And you can even, even at this resolution, start to make out that they fasciculate. Um, so this gives a feel for... Um, what we really have in this data set, I think. Um, if you zoom in and continue with this false color idea, um, an individual section might look like this. And uh, with the false color projection through a, a portion of the data set, um, you end up with something like this. And you know this sort of thing, you can actually make out myelinated axons. Um, and you can make out putative oligodendrocytes and blood vessels. and um, of course, the nuclei of the cells, and here's an apical dendrite coming up. So I'm trying, I'm ex sort of experimenting with this as a way to communicate to light microscopists what EM data looks like. Um, so there's a lot of interesting games we can play immediately with visualization. Um, uh, but importantly, uh, we need to relate the EM data to the in vivo two-photon calcium. Uh, imaging. And so what we did is we filled the animal's vasculature with a red fluorescent dye at the end of the in vivo experiment. So that's what all these red blobs are, are a cross section through the vasculature. Um, the mouse was a transgenic mouse in which a subset of the layer, uh, layer 5 pyramidal cells are labeled with a green fluorophore. And then here is the sphere that was loaded with the calcium sensitive dye. Um, and some features that I've already described. And that's the plane. This is a cross-section um, through the plane um, that we did the calcium imaging on. And um, what we can do is we can relate these sections through the in vivo two photon stack to the EM sections. And if you do a maximum intensity projection of some of the two photon um, slices, and overlay it with a similar projection of the EM data, you get this nice correspondence at the level of tissue um, and even maybe cell bodies. But we need to go a little bit better than that. We need to register individual cells. And um, so what you can see is when we do that, and I, I'm not going to go into the method of it, but it's nothing too fancy. Um, when we do that, um, you can start to see that this, this level here is the false color of this orientation selectivity. And then everywhere else, it's the loading of the OGV, the calcium dye, or the filled blood vessels. If you just go through the series every 50th section, you see that we've achieved this, this correspondence where we can actually relocate at the EM level the cells whose function we characterized in vivo. And so it's this multimodal uh, registration idea. And this is just showing the uh, orientation uh, selectivities and tuning curves of the cells in this particular section. Um, so, uh, you know, this cell here uh, is red. It responds strongly to stimuli uh, at, um, I guess in this scheme, it's 180 degrees and zero degrees. Um, okay, so now what we do is we mark up the data using the EM data set. And this is just a quick and dirty uh, skeletonized rendering of four of the cells in this section, spheres representing the cell bodies, apical dendrites coming up, and axonal arbors um, coming down. And if we do that and extract um, the connectivity graph of the axons coming out of these cell bodies, and locate every bouton that that axon makes, and then reconstruct uh, similarly in this skeletonizing uh, approach um, every postsynaptic target of these axons. Um, what we see is a graph. And I'm not going to show you the hairball. This is enough of a hairball. But the hairball get well, I'll show it to you in a, in a movie. But I'm not going to show it to you in 2D. Um, so let me just flip over to that. OK, so 
just show you this. So now it's all of the cells in our little wedge, our 50 micron wedge. Um, and if we rotate them around, get a sense for the density, even with this incredibly sparse reconstruction. And now here are all of their postsynaptic targets categorized as pyramidal or inhibitory based upon um, their morphology at the ultrastructural level, whether they're smooth or spiny and the kinds of synapses they receive. Um, so we start to get a fair amount of anatomy out of this system um, pretty quickly. Um, okay. And if we render that anatomy as a graph, um, we get something kind of inscrutable. Um, but you see these nodes here, and again, we're running into the limitations of graph viz. But you see this, uh, you know, the colored nodes here fanning out into little, little nodes. Um, but if we zoom in on a portion of it that you can actually see, um, what you see is you see these, these nodes here whose orientation tunings we know, and we see lots of convergence onto these gray nodes, which are inhibitory. And um, you see fan out onto these leaf nodes, which tend to be excitatory. And, and what this is telling us um, at a first pass is that um, the inhibitory cells receive promiscuous input uh, from differently oriented uh, presynaptic uh, partners. And to kind of make clear, let's, what, what is this convergence I'm talking about? I'll just show you a single example um, to try to make it very explicit. Um, so I'll show you this example. And the anatomy looks kind of like this. Um, you have, I've thrown out the, the dendritic arbors and just retained the axonal arbors from the reconstruction. And you see this green cell and the red cell, which have opposite orientation tunings. Um, they're local axonal arbors collateralize and um, before heading down further um, and myelinating and, white, and heading to white matter. Um, or, um, in any event, so the, you have this, the red cell is hitting a branch of this target here and the green cell is hitting it there. And the yellowish color there is our validation. And so what we did is we had an independent person start at the synapse participating in one of these convergence events and either work their way backward to the cell body of the presynaptic cell or forward along the dendrite of the postsynaptic cell to see if they could, um, if, if their reconstruction work equaled the reconstruction work of the person who originally did it. And they, that validation work was done blind to the original work. and um, in, in nearly all cases, in all cases of the postsynaptic dendrite, um, they got the same answer. And in a f two or three cases of the presynaptic axon, the answers were different. And here's just some of the EM um, of a synapse. You know, so this would be the seed for validation and then work backward along the axon or uh, forward along the spine um, or shaft in that case. Um, okay, so when you finish with this, um, you get this validated convergence graph. And so, you know, our 10 terabytes for this round of analysis distill down to this pretty simple graph. Um, and we're working on analyzing it quantitatively with, you know, the relatively low end that we have to show that um, the convergence here onto the postsynaptic targets seems to draw from the uniform distribution. Um, we're playing around with uh, different ways to visualize it. So here's the full graph laid out in brain space. Um, so you can kind of mix it, mix it up a little bit. Um, the presynaptic cells are all laid out in brain space. The postsynaptic cells are laid out arbitrarily for clarity. The converged upon nodes are inside this cube. The leaf nodes are around the edge. So we've got some ideas for how to play with visualization. Um, but of course, we want to think about this system. I mean, this is still, I mean, OK, it's neat, but it's still a relatively impoverished view of cortical processing. Um, and what we really want to do is think about it as you know, more of a, a set of feed forward layers and arrays of cells. And of course, there's feedback. And we want to look at um, whether or not the buildup of receptive field structure can be explained by extracted wiring. Um, and to do that, we need, as I'm saying, so this was the current round. That was the throughput rate uh, of the current 
microscope and we'd like to scale up and we have some pretty clear ideas about how to do that. So the message is this stuff is coming. Um, big data are coming. They're starting to be real and they're going to get bigger and uh, we need help. So, <laughs> um, And on that note I'm going to switch gears and just talk about um, a few um, lessons and thoughts on the relationship of software to the biology that we're trying to do. So in 2008 um, parallelized tile stitching using open source photo montage software and bash scripts, okay, I mean just pull it desperate, Let, pull stuff off the shelf and try it out. Um, tile layout again using pieces of existing uh, infrastructure including from the Mark Lab. Um, at that time their workflow was much less advanced as far as I know and so we had to keep improvising um, but this was a useful tool uh, for a while. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see the progress actually um, and viewing using a few different tools and then it changed quickly um, so the tile stitching stayed the same tile layout um, you know homebrewed crummy tools with a sp open source spring mass library um, and then we modified uh, the reconstruct software to handle large data and now um, a long-standing collaboration with a group at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center is bearing fruit. They're actually stitching and aligning the full data set at full resolution. And um, I lightly customized a version of the Track EM2 tool that's part of the Fiji package uh, from Albert Cardona. Um, and so what you can see is that, like Robert was saying, um, you know, he, he mentioned that ontologies needed to float. Uh, we don't know what we're doing. Well, when we start throwing really big data at existing tools, they break. And so our workflow floats as well. So a couple of lessons I learned is that having a biologist, that would be me, who can code a little bit, is good. Um, it helps to prototype, and it really helps with communicating with experts. Um, OK, and I'm, just, I'm almost done with this. Um, a diversity of tools is actually really good. So you guys are kind of talking about how you want, you want the world to converge, and there's too much. Uh, overlap of effort, but I would say that from my point of view as somebody prototyping workflow, having lots of options to try out um, was actually really useful. Uh, it let me get something working fast. Um, please be tolerant of our stupidity uh, when we make this stuff up because if we don't get something done, we lose funding and we, we fail. Um, so we're going to we're going to do stuff that you think is stupid, and sometimes we know it, and sometimes we don't. But if we don't get it done, we die. Um, and so I've run into that. Like CS collaborators say, well, why are you doing this? This is insane. Well, because if we don't do anything, we die. Um, so be tolerant of us. There's a hole in academic science. Um, we need a machine. Like most departments in neuroscience have a machine shop. I wish we had such a thing for software development. Um, there's no model for this. Academic collaborations have different drivers. The academic collaborators need to advance the state of the art with algorithm development. A lot of times we don't need that. We just need workflow. Um, this is really important. And what this says is that the more reconstruction we do on the same data set, the more we understand the many-to-many -many connectivity. So our sense as we did this work was that the number of convergence events was going up with the square of the number of nodes we reconstructed and um, so getting the data out there for lots of people to work on is important and lastly um, tool virality so um, you know make it fun make it something that scientists adopt make it accessible to um, the common man to, to play with the data and I think that we'll, we'll get some traction uh, thank you Well, I want to thank Davi for a great talk. In fact, all the speakers for staying very much on time with so much interesting data.